<laughs> Hi everybody, Tinfoil Hat Lady back with uh, my Shaman Trent Deerhorn and um, we're going to talk a little bit more uh, about um, Trent's uh, career as a shaman and I'm just really interested and I'm sure you guys are too in um, the history of how Trent actually became a shaman. Like how does one get into becoming a shaman, Trent? How did this happen for you? Well, a variety of ways is how people can do this but um, for myself in particular, I was born into a family where this sort of stuff was dinner table conversation. Wow. And it was never shut down as many people experience when they're just starting to explore as young people. And so um, all of my interests and all of my abilities uh, that started developing as a child were encouraged. And so as I went through life, um, it was one of those things where, you know, people often think that they have to travel into a jungle to get the training yeah. that they need and stuff. I somehow just knew as a child, I'm not going to have to do that. And as a result of that belief, I think, teachers came to me oh, okay. and said, you know, I would like to teach you about this. And so I would learn and learn and learn because it just fascinated me. And I was a sponge for information, <laughs> man. <laughs> well, so was this the, always the career path that you thought or did you think about doing other jobs? Um, I have done everything from selling Tupperware to roofing to <laughs> being in the reserves in the military. I've done everything. But um, every time I went to get a little further and further away from what my path here is, I kept getting pulled back into it. Oh, you know, when I first saw you speak at Spirit Works, didn't you say something about going, um, being affiliated with the church some way, getting education yes, in the church? Yes, yes. I thought at first, um, well, if I'm going to do this, then I need some kind of legitimacy, right? Oh, and therefore, okay. I should maybe look into becoming a minister. And as I became um, more and more educated through that process, I realized more and more, this is not what resonates for me. And then there's I had, not enough magic in the church. There's not enough magic in the church. <laughs> and it was very interesting because even though I never spoke about any of my shamanic background, right. there was a professor who one day said to me, I understand that you are thinking of becoming a minister. And I said, yes. And he said, I just have to say this. Please don't. And I was shocked. And I said, well, why would I not? And he said, because... You're meant for greater things than just being a minister. And I have a feeling that you need to actually more explore like world religions and maybe even shamanism. And I started to laugh. And I said, um, actually, <laughs> I've already done that for you years. You made that choice already. <laughs> so now that you are a shaman, yes. um, I know you do different ceremonies and stuff. Now, um, do you want to just give us a rundown on some of the... You know, the basic ceremonies that, that you can offer people. Oh, sure, um, sure. You know. Um, okay, so some of them are things like hand fasting ceremonies. Which What's a hand fasting ceremony? It, it is like a, a wedding. A wedding? Yes, it's like a wedding. It, it helps people to, in a, in a ceremony, acknowledge their loving bond with each other and their intent to be together. Now, on the other end of it, you know how in our culture we have weddings and then we also have divorces? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, we also have an unhand fasting ceremony oh, that can be done. Okay. And this is when the couple have come to the point in their lives where they have realized that now they're growing completely separately and it's more harmful to stay together and try to make that work than it is to go their separate ways in a loving way. No, I heard about a hand fasting that it's something that you want to renew every year. Is in, that something that you suggest? In for? most traditions, yes, the, the uh, renewal thing does happen on a yearly basis, usually around Beltane. And Beltane, is that May 1st? Yes, May 1st, yeah, May 1st or April Beginning 30th. Of around yeah, that time. somewhere in there a lot of people renew at that time okay and in the spring in the spring and uh as people renew then it, it just sort of reaffirms that yes i'm in still kind gives of you thing. a chance to think about whether you're in or out exactly it, right. and it it leaves room to to ponder and to really consider is this something i want in my life i like that yeah it is it's that a, makes a it great conscious option. you don't take your partner for granted then if you're doing that that's right year, do you? that's right it, it makes it much more conscious intent. And the thing that I find really interesting about this is that this is not a legal ceremony. So I have actually a person that I work with who is a marriage commissioner. 
Oh, so you we can will get make it legally. a legal oh, thing. Oh, okay, okay, you know? right, right. I was wondering about that. Exactly, too, yeah. and then, and I mean, some people don't want the legal aspect involved, and that's fine. Then they'd be common law, I guess. Then, if they... then they would be common law, exactly. Okay. But the same legal procedures still apply to them in a common law relationship. Okay. Now, what if somebody dies in your family? Then we have what? crossing ceremonies. Crossing. Yes, uh, it's considered crossing the veil. So they're going from this world into the other world. And the crossing ceremony right. isn't so much for the person who is crossing over as much as it is for those who are here. The ones that are left. Yeah, having okay. to release them into the light. And so part, okay. it can look like anything. Uh, most of it looks like a party. <laughs> but like a wake. Like a wake. Maybe. Yeah, exactly. Sh stories are shared about the person. Right. There are certain things that I like to do, like light a candle in honor of that person. And that candle burns as a way of, of helping the person find their way into the light through the veil. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. So there's things like that that are, you know, little ritual things that, that help. I along. suppose the family then can work with you on the specifics of that kind of a ceremony. Like yeah. A little bit. Absolutely. You know, what they would like. Absolutely. Done in that because situation. it's not something that's written in stone that you have to always do it my way or you have to always do it a certain way. It, it's, it's kind of empowering to the other person to use the shaman, isn't it? Because it is. there's really more creativity and more authenticity of the Absolutely. individual reflection of their needs, isn't there? Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. I like that. Now, what happens if. Uh, if you're really sick of somebody, um, like say somebody's really abusive to you in your life and you want to get them out of your life, do you have anything for that? Toxic tie severing ceremony. Toxic tie. <laughs> Ooh, we don't want any toxic ties. No. How and does that work? You know what's really interesting about toxic that tie. is that toxic energy can find its way into your energy from someone else and wrap itself around the loving energy that's actually And you might there. not even know that's happening, exactly. I think, right? Exactly, exactly. And so what we do is in the ceremony, we ritually sever the toxic energies, release those to be healed, okay, and then keep the loving ties. Oh. And quite often there's a, a dramatic ripple effect. Now, this is the one ceremony where I have to say people experience a lot of um, ripple effect reactions from people who have never realized that they've ever done any sort of ceremonial thing. They can feel that the person has changed and they cannot be toxic around them. Wow. And so they want them to fit into their little paradigm still. And it doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't interesting. work. interesting. Yeah. So one more thing I know that you do that I find very interesting is the concept of like, if you get a new home or if you think your house is haunted or something, <laughs> is there anything that you can do for that? Yes. Yes. It's called house clearing and house blessing. Ooh. And uh, what that entails is I come into your home scan through the energy system and find any disembodied spirits that are earthbound, communicate with them. Maybe there's a reason that they're there. Maybe there's right. a reason they're upset, etc. Yeah. But the thing is to reestablish harmony and peaceful relations within that home environment. And some of them have to be escorted into the light, yes. So you're very respectful. You don't try to piss anybody off. Oh, no. I... <laughs> The last thing I would want to do is try to piss off a spirit yeah. because, I mean, they have resources we don't have. That's know? right. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a, it's about just um, creating the, the harmonious environment once again and helping any earthbounds into the light so that they can heal again. And, and remember when we were using those ting shaws, those, oh, yeah. those little bells? I found that it really works great in the, in the upper corners of Absolutely. rooms to like ring those into the room's uh, upper corners. And, yeah. and that can really clear a space with sound. Oh, as well as intention, yeah. right? And to go to each of the directions and ring them and stuff. And, and also to, if you have four ting shaws, then you can have four people ring them simultaneously, each awesome. facing a different direction. It just clears it up like crazy. That's yeah. really a good idea. I really like that. Well, Trent, yeah. thanks for sharing with us today. Um, we're going to be Thank talking you. to you again and yes. have you back on Tinfoil Hat Ladies' channel and maybe eventually get your own channel. Woohoo! Woohoo! <laughs> so uh, this is Trent Deerhorn, and he's my great shaman, and I'm happy that I could introduce him to you guys. So have a good day out there.